Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Ryan Alcantara with uh, USC's Rossier Career Services, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to uh, the USC Rossier Executive Search Firm Series, Higher Education and uh, Independent Schools Edition. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Heather Larrabee, who is a manage, uh, manager or managing senior consultant at Spelman Johnson. Spelman Johnson is a leader in higher education executive searches, but their scope includes independent schools, professional associations, nonprofits, and social impact organizations. As we get started, as I mentioned just a, a couple of minutes ago, um, I wanted to share that we're running this as a Zoom meeting rather than a webinar to encourage discussion and engagement with our presenter. Um, please turn on your cameras if you're able to do that. And when we get started with questions, you can raise your hand uh, and ask those questions directly to the presenter. We also had a number of um, questions that were submitted. So we'll be able to kind of start with those and, and those were provided to um, Heather as well. So we'll, we'll get into that as we, we go through this. So um, as I mentioned, we are blessed to have Dr. Heather Larrabee, uh, who is a highly dedicated professional who thrives on establishing genuine connections with clients and candidates. As an experienced uh, search consultant, she brings a wealth of expertise and a strong passion for cultivating meaningful relationships that lead to outstanding outcomes. Heather offers a distinctive value proposition that differentiates the firm and she upholds a commitment to transparency, building solid partnerships and ensuring accessibility uh, in her work. Uh, Heather's areas of expertise uh, in interest span diverse roles within student affairs, including student activities, leadership development, engagement, student unions, and positions such as chief of staff, registrar, public safety, law enforcement, and emergency management. Her extensive experience allows her to bring a comprehensive perspective to her search work. Heather earned her doctorate in educational leadership at USC Rossier. She also worked here um, at USC serving as the Assistant Dean of Students and Director of Campus Activities. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with, with Heather back in, in our student activities days um, through NACA. Uh, so it's always great to, to reconnect with um, past colleagues and, and, and friends and, and alums. Um, Heather has also worked at St. Francis Marion University and the University of Tennessee Knoxville. Uh, Dr. Larrabee, welcome and thank you for joining us to share your story and provide insights in working with searches um, for leadership positions through Spelman Johnson. And I'll turn it over to you. You're muted. Heather, you are muted. Still? Did you mute me? No, you're good now. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, look, I've already failed. So, okay, well, no more problems. I got that one out of the way. So here we go. I will try again. So <laughs> I was saying, thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciate that. I'm very happy to be here. Um, love that I, I get a chance to come back and talk to fellow Trojans. I'm always on the lookout for Trojans when we I travel in the airport and you're know, always willing to flash that fight on. And, and people always look at you so so funny with, when you don't have USC stuff on already. They're like, oh, they get it. They got it. So happy to be here. Um, I will just share a little bit about my journey. Um, and then I'm going to go into some of the search stuff. But I want to let you know, I did not go into higher ed thinking that I was going to end up as a search consultant. Um, that was wasn't, I didn't even know what, a, much like you probably at some point, didn't even know they had search firms um, in higher education for the longest time. So, um, but it was because of a network that I um, actually started well back into graduate school um, that somebody had worked for, um, I was working with NACA, this individual started working for Spelman Johnson, you know, things started changing for me um, and I ended up connecting with him and got this job at Spelman Johnson. But I spent a um, little over 18 years in student affairs, um, but the bulk of that was at USC. So almost 15 years there. Um, in fact, they uh, talked me into getting my doctorate and I was like, oh, okay, I like school supplies. So yeah, we'll give that a shot. Um, so and loved it. Um, but working at USC was um, 
I, I, I did. I really, being from Florida and, and not knowing the soul out there, USC was my home, USC is my family, um, and, and loved all the students and, and everything that we accomplished when I was out there. So near and dear to my heart. And in fact, now, um, when I made the transition into search and was working from home, um, I was so worried about not having the energy from having, you know, being on a college campus. So one of my favorite things about being a search consultant is going to those campuses, learning about the people there, but also working with the students. So the student meetings always make me, you know, quite happy. So uh, I have now been, and this is frightening, been with Spelman Johnson for almost 11 years um, doing search. So someday I think I'm going to write a book um, because uh, the firm likes to make fun of me because if it's going to happen during an, a travel, either, you know, plane, trains, automobiles, it's going to happen to me. So um, I have some funny stories about people I have met and sat next to on planes and things that have happened, but that's a, that's another webinar. Uh, <laughs> so um, what I would like to do is just, so I, I got kind of the three big buckets. So you know, how do you get on the search firm's radar? So I wanted to talk about that, the difference between working with a, a search firm as opposed to um, an institution's HR, and then some of the benefits of working for a search firm. So one of the things I will share with you about Spelman Johnson is um, we started, when I joined back 11 years ago, we were maybe seven or eight people. We're not a huge firm. There's maybe 16 of us now that are working in the search piece of it. We do have headquarters, but we all come from higher ed. We all have, have had so a past life in some avenue of higher education. And the reason I tell you that is that's important because we can speak the language when we're talking with both the client, which is our institution, and then the candidates. So we can we have a general understanding, can pick up on some of the nuances, um, and that's really critical for you as a candidate then to be able to ask us questions because we can give you a sense of the culture and, and and you know really what's going on on campus. So. How do you get on our radar? And like I said, I didn't know they were search firms. Um, and then, you know, as I kind of progressed in my career, I heard of Spelman, it used to be Spelman and Johnson Group. I heard about Spelman Johnson. I was like, oh, I wonder if I'll ever hear from them. And the first time I got an email from them, I was like, oh, I've made it. You know, so, somebody thought enough of me. This is great. Um, you know, I'm, I'm on their radar. Um, now that I work for them and I don't want to burst anyone's bubble, it's really easy to get on our radar. You can do it yourself. Um, you can join our network. And it's really just going to our website and joining our network. And it's Spelman and Johnson. Or I'm sorry. Yeah, Spelman and Johnson .com. You join, um, put your areas of interest. We'll start sending you, when we have a position announcement, we'll start sending you those announcements for things that you're interested in. Um, you can also get nominated for a position and then um, that'll put you into our network Then we'll be aware of you. Um, and you can obviously, if you apply for a position, then that gets you in our network as well. Um, and, you know, lots of times we'll hear, we'll do research. If we're doing a position that we haven't done in a while, or it might be something new, um, we'll, we'll do research on institutions and start pulling people um, and, and adding you in at that point. So if you haven't joined yourself and you get something from us, it's probably because we did some research and thought you were wonderful and added you into our um, database. So again, if that, I hate to burst anyone's bubble, but if you're getting emails from us, that's wonderful. If not, join and uh, you too can get emails from us. Um, but the important things about that is, so why are why use the search firm or why how are we different? When you're working with a search firm, we have, as consultants, we've been to campus. So we do what we call a site visit and we spend a full day talking to a bunch of, the, of, of different stakeholders. Um, from your direct reports, so the position's direct reports, students, um, the president, uh, vice president, leadership, whatever it might be, different stakeholders, alums, families, if we're, um, especially if we're doing something for some of the independent schools, we will meet with the families um, to kind of understand what their needs are. So we talk to a, a good section of, of individuals and we will write what we call a position specification and which is like, it's a term paper um, going back to school but we post this on our website and it really gets into much more information about what the institution's looking for. So challenges, opportunities for success, um, how success might be measured, you know, really what the institution's looking for. So when we post a job and you'll see this, if you know, you'll see, um, you know, a paragraph or two about the position and then maybe some of the qualifications, this goes into much more detail about the, what they're looking for. Generally, when an institution's doing their search, they don't do that. 
um, nor do they actually actively go out and recruit. Um, if the institution is doing a search, it usually goes up on their website, they'll post it on a few different platforms, and, and that's about it. We will actively seek out candidates um, and call people. And, and I'm not saying that's, that I'm not trying to put the institution down. It's just that's what we do. We have time for that. So we will build that pool, go down that rabbit hole of, hey, you know, this person's not interested, but have a conversation with them because they know somebody else. And so we'll keep having those conversations. And that's the fun part for me is getting candidates excited about a job and having, you know, having this conversation. So you should always, if there is a position that you see an email that we send out, or if you're on our website um, and you're interested, look to see who's managing the search and there'll be an email associated with that. Send us an email and ask to have a conversation. Um, we know the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we're going to share that with you. And I'll tell you why, because we guarantee our searches for a year, and it does us no good not to be transparent with you. So we want you to know everything. So you're coming into a search with much more information than you would if you were just kind of applying kind of cold to the, to the institution. Um, and we also can share things that we can't put in writing. <laughs> so, um, you know, ask us some of those questions and, we'll, you know, we'll be able to answer some of those more difficult questions for you. Um, somebody, I know one of the questions was about an interim and if there's an interim, you know, should I apply? Or we can talk about that a little bit more, but ask, that's the time that you can ask those questions when you're talking to the search consultant. Is there an interim? Is there an internal? You know, what do they really want to hire somebody outside of your institution? You know, all of those types of questions we can help answer for you. And we're really there for you throughout the whole search. Um, from start to finish. So when you're first interested to once you apply to as you move through, we will share the timeline with you. We will communicate with you. Even if you're not moving forward, we will let you know that as soon as we can. And I still laugh about when I was getting out of grad school looking for my first job back, you know, when cell phones were the size of a brick. Um, I still haven't heard from some of them, so I can only assume I didn't get the job, <laughs> but, you know, it's nice to know, <laughs> so nice not to, you know, have to make that assumption that they didn't want you, but anyway, so we'll make sure that we communicate with you, and if you have questions, then we can help you, and sometimes we can't really give direct feedback uh, from, from the, what we've heard when we've met with the search committee, but we can talk about you know, your uh, materials and how you may want to change this moving forward, or we can kind of help that way or help you, you know, answer some of those questions and help you prep for the next time you go through the process. Um, one of the things I love about Spelman Johnson, I think that we take care of, so we take care of our candidates. We want to make sure you have a good experience, even if you don't get the job, even if you don't move forward, we want to make sure the experience you have with us um, is educational for you, it's meaningful, it helps you in some way in your career. And one of these days, one of them will stick and you'll find your perfect job. And you know that's really what we're here for. The other thing I'd say with um, working with a search firm is really um, be honest with us. Um, tell us what your salary, you know, this is what I need. Um, and especially if y'all are moving out of California because California salaries are higher just because the cost of living is higher, but tell us what, what your needs are and let's do a realistic conversation of how much that's gonna translate someplace else. Um, but also um, in the days of uh, social media now, if there's anything out there on social media or anything that happened that you think we should know about, let us know um, so we can have a conversation about it. Because if we know about it ahead of time, when we're talking to the search committee, we can just kind of we can let them know about it, but we cannot make it a big deal. If we don't know about it and some, you know, students are always gonna Google whoever's coming to campus and if there's something out there and we haven't told the search committee about it, that looks bad. Then it looks like you might be hiding something or we didn't do our job, but to best really represent you, if, you know, be honest with us about your needs, you know, where you wanna live, all of those types of things so we can help you with that. Um, and again, you don't necessarily get that from working directly with a with an HR team. And I hope there's nobody here from HR because I don't want to speak ill of them. I'm just saying it's a little bit different. Um, so the benefits of working with a search firm. So I talked a little bit about them, but again, it's just the much more information. 
I would be, if I was your search consultant, you could reach out to me at any time. You would, you know, email me. Um, you can get my cell phone. You can text me when you've got questions. Hey, I haven't heard this. I had a quick question about this. Whatever it might be that we are there for you the entire process. So use us, um, but also know that that's what we're there for. Um, we can really help you with your interview prep. So if you're going through, um, especially first rounds, but they're generally a Zoom conversation, we can say, hey, we really think these are the questions you're gonna be asked. So focus, focus on these areas. And if something came up and someone thought you might have been like, oh, you know, I think his experience is a little bit questionable on this. I'm gonna share that with you and go, hey, prep on this because they're probably gonna push you a little bit more. They wanna understand your experiences better. But what I love about this job is we get to represent you. So when, when we're working with the search committee, the search committee sees you on paper, but we've talked to you. You're, you're a real person to us. And, you know, we have gone through and said, if there's, you know, if there's, you all have heard this, if there's anything discrepancy in your resume, there are six months that looks like you weren't working. The search committee is going to go to the worst place possible about whatever happened to you. So if we already have the information, it's like, no, no, this is what happened. Or if you've moved around a lot, which we can talk about too, if you've you know been in a lot of places for just a year, year and a half, and, and that looks like a pattern, if there's a reason for that, we can talk about that on your behalf. And I cannot tell you the amount of people that have actually ended up getting the job that the search committee initially didn't want to give the job, didn't even want to have an interview with because they were making kind of assumptions based on what they saw which, uh, on the resume. But as a search consultant, you can talk about the candidate and actually um, make it more favorable and help them understand what that experience was and the whys behind some of those things that you just, you can't do in a resume or in a cover letter. And the other piece is really just forming that relationship with us because you know, only one person is going to get that job. But now that you have a relationship with us and we know what you're looking for, then we can, if we have another search that's similar to that, then we're going to reach out to you and go, hey, I know you were in, in this search. Would you be interested in this school, similar position, and then talk to you about it? And you may say, no, I don't want to move there. Or that's not, you know, it, that's not exactly what I want. That's fine. But at least now you've got that contact and connection with us. And then we also... We share people. So if I'm like, hey, I've got this fabulous candidate, didn't get to, didn't get the job here at UMass, but I think you should, you know, look at this person for another job. So again, it's kind of that networking thing. So um, forming that relationship with a search consultant is is very helpful, you know, as you go through the process. Um, and I've actually, um, I, I, I'm Facebook friends with some of the people that I've placed. You just kind of stay in, in, in touch with them. And then as they move, you kind of watch their career progress. Um, and, you know, they're actually I have friends from USC um, that were never in one of my searches, but I redid their resume for them, um, which is shocking because I never did my resume when I was at USC. And now that's what I do for a living. So see, things change. Never say never. Um, and, but I saw him then on a search committee and he was like, oh my gosh, I'm here because of the resume you redid, you know, you did for me. So make those connections and use us. It's really what we're here for. So that was kind of the three buckets. Did I go too fast for that? But so I was going to open it up for questions now. Sure. Well, thank you so much. And I, I think that's helpful. And I, I want to um, kind of emphasize a few points. And, and you said this, but I want to be very clear. If, if you see a position that's posted through a search firm, before you submit your application, connect with the search firm. Um, you They can provide some insights as you're constructing your, your cover letter and certainly going into interview. So um, one of the huge advantages, because you, uh, and again, there's nothing wrong with, with HR operations at universities, but there's just some things they can't do. They're not gonna facilitate conversations, provide inside perspectives to potential candidates and certainly not existing candidates. But that's the kind of relationship you can have with a search firm. Um, ultimately, search firms are, um, you know, hired by the schools and the, uh, the school and institution, and they're looking to to leverage the search firms, you know, database um, and the ability to go out there and find strong candidates. Uh, and so that helpful, too, because it's it's not I mean, they're they're just trying to find the right people. Um, so the other thing I would encourage is just making sure 
like you can develop a strong connection with Spelman Johnson, but you can connect with other search firms too. It's not like you can be on only one list. Oh, um, yeah. You should be on all their lists mm -hmm. um, because an institution is just going to decide who they utilize. Um, so this is this has been helpful. So let's jump into to some of the specific questions. And uh, I, I'm going to go from the list, but if people want to ask questions, I encourage you to raise your hand. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a few questions that were submitted through registration, so we'll start with those. But certainly want to give uh, folks uh, in the in the Zoom call now an opportunity to ask questions directly. So there's some questions about career transitions, and we have a number of of students. Well, I'll just say within Rossier, we've got a diversity of majors. Some are clearly aligned with with education, um, other programs like our OCL, Organizational Change and Leadership, and our global EDD programs have students from with a lot of background. We, ha we tend to have a number of, of students that come in um, with military background or business backgrounds. You know, for those that go through the program and they're now interested in higher education, um, have you worked with folks that are pivoting into leadership roles with limited background? What should students be thinking about and, and how mm -hmm. can a search firm help to navigate that? Mm -hmm. um, great question. And I and I just want to go back and say, I am sorry if I acted like you could only work with Spellman Johnson. Not the case. You're absolutely right. Use them all. Um, we're just nicer, I think. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Please use them all. But um, yeah, I actually, I work with, a lot with military um, and also some, uh, some folks that come in from the private sector trying to get into... Um, get into higher ed. Um, I would say one of the things for you, and you need to reach out to your consultant and use that relationship and really talk with them. They're gonna be able to help you say, you know, you know, this is how you need to, and what you can do is send your resume prior to, prior to actually applying for the position so we can look at it and look at your cover letter and say, hey, I think you need to tweak this or this might work better for you. Um, the one thing about military is uh, your resume is, is, and it's funny, I'm going to use this word jargony, not that higher ed isn't, but um, things mean a lot to you that don't, that we don't know. And I'm a military brat, so I get some of it, but you really need to kind of tone that piece of it down and help the search committee understand and help them see how you could fit in. So with your cover letter, um, you know, I think you need to spend a lot of time with that and really help them see how you could be a benefit. And don't just list what you put in your resume and your cover letter. Really talk to them about if I was there, these are the skills and this is how, this is what I could do with them. And pull language that they've put into the position and amount announcement saying what they're looking for. Use that same language, you know, mirror that in your cover letter um, and do research on the institution so that they've seen that you get it. And for what kills me is when people are applying for jobs at universities or colleges or the independent schools, they don't use the word student um, in their in their cover letter, and they but they yet they want to work with students in some way. So make sure you really kind of understand the campus, what they're looking for, um, and use that language. But you, especially for military making that transition, the um, and I hate to say it, but I, there's some bias for some, I, and I'm thinking more, I've done a lot of public safety searches and there's a lot of military, um, and even municipal police trying to get to, you know, chief of police um, on a college campus and using the, the word subordinate um, does not go over well. And um, it's just that it's just like, you know, oh, you don't understand us and really understanding the nuances of a college campus. So you have to make sure that they can see that in your materials but also that you've talked with your search consultant so they can bring that forward when they meet with the search committee. Thank you. And I'll mention uh, transitions. I really encourage uh, students and alum to look at informal, net, uh, informal interviews and, and just networking as a way to understand some of that, you know, what's the vernacular. Uh, you want to get those insights. And so I, I posted, we did a, a networking uh, for success uh, workshop, we talked about. I talked about informational interviews, so I put that in the chat if folks need some more information about that. But really, if you're looking to pivot, having that context, talking to people you know, getting referred from by other folks, and and utilizing the Trojan network is really really important to help you be successful in that process because it is a big thing. I mean, even within higher education, community colleges use different terminology than. Mm -hmm. um, 
than four year institutions. And if you if you say that in your cover letter, you say that in your interview, it can knock you out. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely use those connections. And you know, if you're looking to, to transition to community college, to an independent school, whatever that might be, and if you know, use them, talk to them. What's happening? What's a day in your life there? But if you need help with the connection, you don't know somebody, then reach out to us and let us know, and we'll we'll work to connect you because we'll know somebody who'll be happy to have a conversation with you about you know what it's like on their campus to help you. And uh, Deb Lacasio posted a question. Uh, Deb, if you're there, feel free to. Uh, I, I'm happy to bring you in on the question or bring you in on the conversation. But she posted. How limited are roles for those without uh, doctorates, um, especially as we've got obviously a lot of master students, mm -hmm. um, or in particular in uh, uh, a master's in our post-secondary administration student affairs position. Do you have positions where you're looking for candidates with master's degrees? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, generally, and and honestly, when we um, work with the search committee, we say. Let, we're going to cast a wide net. So let's start with a requirement is the master's degree and preferred could be, you know, the PhD or EDD um, and, and see what you get. And, you know, lots of times, you know, the master's degree with your experiences, that's what's going to knock it out of the park is it's being able to talk about it. And, and that's the thing I really want to impress upon you in, in this conversation is um, you can't get a job if you don't apply for it. So if you look at something and you see it and you're like, oh, I'd love to do that. Then you start making excuses about why you can't. Don't do that. Like you have to, you know, I will talk to you and I'll talk you up and be like, let me see your resume. This is why you'd be good at it. And, and or somebody else can do it for you because lots of people think you're probably much more wonderful than you think you are and you just don't see it or you're being modest. But you can't get the job if you don't apply for it. So absolutely, you know, use that network again um, for that, but let them help you with that. But yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. And, and, you know, generally you want to look at the preferred uh, and required um, uh, criteria that's listed on the position, but the advantage of working through a search firm is you can ask those questions like how important is this and never discount your experience. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, an excellent point. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth, I'm going to have you, you can unmute and, and join the conversation. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, and thank you, Heather. Um, yes, I too am one of those fight on people in all corners of the world. That's nice. Um, <clears throat> the question for you is this. Um, some of us, myself included, uh, transitioned to smaller campuses during COVID in a time mm -hmm. of need and response. You know, I was recruited from one campus to another. Um, I'd like to get back to my roots in this in public education, uh, going back to bigger schools. So going back to the CSU. Mm -hmm. From a search firm experience standpoint, is there a hesitation when you're looking at a candidate who's got the title, the experience and all of that, but in a small campus environment and whether or not that translates to a large campus environment like a CSU. Right, right. And an excellent question. And, and another thing that I love because I love working with, with search committees and, and I was like, hey, can you look at the qualifications and tell me where it says they couldn't work at a small school? Like, you know, I, I, I because, you know, when you start, when they start going, oh no. So you have to talk about scaling up and your understanding of that within your cover letter, but absolutely not small school folks. Y'all are doing so much work because we all know you wear, you know, that one hat is ginormous and you've got a closet full of them. So you're doing a lot. So use that experience. But absolutely not. I mean, you'll get some folks on a search committee that are like, oh, I just don't think that school's too small. But then we, your search consultant's job is really to kind of work through that. Now, if you don't have us and you're doing it on your own, you need to put that in your cover letter and talk about, you know, I understand that this your institution's bigger. I've done this. This is how it translates. Because the work is the work. You're just going to do it for more students. So, yeah. Right. You'll get there. Yeah. And if, have you worked at a big school before? And you, like you said, you transitioned out during COVID. Yes, my entire career has been in higher ed uh, at campuses of 28,000 or oh. more. Yeah. And then I was at a 10,000 campus and now I'm at a 1500 campus. Um, and it's my first time in private ed. Yeah. Um, so getting back to, uh, again, my my roots. In the, I'm, I'm a three time CSU alum. 
Nice. Um, and a raw Sierra love. So yeah. both public and private, but mm -hmm. yes, no, I, I, as you said, the work is the work and you just scale it up. I just want to make mm -hmm. sure that it's not because my most recent, you know, mm -hmm. the top bullet on my CV is a small school where everything else is 28,000 plus students. Yeah. No, and especially since you have the bigger schools in your background, you know, I think I think it makes you a unique candidate to have such a different perspective, you know, being able to see small, private, medium size, you know, large. So, you know, copy that. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'll add, you know, the narrative is important. Being able to explain that journey in a succinct way um, is is critical but also trying to avoid, we sometimes use deficit language. I know this is a, a large institution and I come from a small institution. You wanna really make sure you're not giving a search committee ammunition um, to, to go against you. So, so looking at how you have that narrative so it, it, it accentuates the positive is really important. And if um, I can share one thing, um... A, a funny, not funny story. It's actually a good story. So I was doing a search and I had a, um, one of the requirements was a supervisory component. They wanted the, the individual was going to supervise, I don't know, five to eight employees. They really wanted to make sure someone had had supervision before. And I talked to this woman who was a wonderful candidate, but her supervision wasn't professional staff. It was students and volunteers. And we had an excellent conversation about that because how hard is it? It's even harder sometimes when you're supervising volunteers because they could they could legitimately flake on you. Um, but we talked about how her plan was and she had evaluation plans. She did onboarding for them. You know, she you know, really utilized them and really helped them that process to really see themselves as employees, whether they were, you know, volunteers or, or student workers or whatever it was. She got the job. She beat out people who had, you know, eight or nine people already reporting to them because she talked so well about how she supervised and the skills that she used and how she worked with and developed her employees. So again, going back to the deficit, don't use the deficit language like, I, oh, I've only supervised this. No, you've supervised people, you've worked with them, you know, own that, but but use that. But I, I see, I hear a lot of people, oh, I didn't apply because they needed, you know, four to five people that I've supervised. Well, I'm sure you've done that in some way. We just need to figure out a, a way for you to talk about that. Great. Uh, Jenny, I see your hand up, but I'm going to bring Andrew in. Uh, he he was on deck. So Jenny, you'll be you'll be next. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, thanks, Heather. It's evidently clear how much you care about the folks that you get to work with uh, just in the 35 minutes you've been sharing with us. So yeah, appreciate You're understanding welcome. that. Uh, side of the coin uh, when we get to work with search firms. My question is about considering all the experience you have working with different institutions, my question is specifically about dean's positions, uh, associate provost positions. Those are um, the types of roles that uh, I get to work with now and I'm interested in pursuing. Mm -hmm. What's around the corner when you talk to institutions? What are they concerned about what's around the corner? uh you know the next five years ten years and how does that translate into we're really looking for someone who has experience doing x or someone who can help lead us into and towards why mm -hmm. excellent question and off the top of my head uh staying in business um <laughs> we really yeah i mean the, the we talk about the the enrollment cliff and we're experiencing that now i know they said the um, financial aid was down what 34 percent applications were down 34 percent so you know what does that look like but for these smaller private schools and some of these even smaller regional schools that's a real concern um um but but after that, I would say um, the whole is higher education worth it. What mm -hmm. are we doing? You know, and that's something. How are we going to make ourselves? You know, it, it, prices keep going up. How do we make ourselves more valuable? You know, what can we do to really kind of beat out our competition and make us the school that people want to go to? I mean, it sounds cutthroat, but it's that's where we're going for many because it, it's going to be you know either do it or or your institution is not going to be there anymore. Brilliant. Um, okay. The, AI um, is really interesting too right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, and in a, I was this this was fascinating. I was doing an academic integrity search, which I was like, I learned something, which was fabulous. But you know, we talked a lot about AI then. 
But in a search committee, they were reviewing, reviewing applications and they were like, oh, this person used AI. And I'm like, you know, how do you know that? Because it was buzzwords. And I was like, no, no, these are buzzwords in the, in the field that, you know, this, it's not AI. So we kind of had to talk them off that ledge because they were trying to ding the person for it. But I was like, this is opening up a whole new thing for search is that we've got to be careful, you know, careful. And what people don't realize is you put something in AI, it's out there forever, you know, and it's you know, attached to you. So, you know, so someone could absolutely steal your language, steal your words. So, um, but I think that the whole AI thing is going to, is changing rapidly and we are trying to understand it and do our best with it. Um, oh, it, it's going to revolutionize so many industries, ours included. To do yeah. this, uh, I have to, just since you brought it into the conversation, mm -hmm. Ethan Mollick, he's a management professor at Wharton, his new book, Co-Intelligence, Living and Working with Artificial Intelligence, just came out. Everyone cannot recommend it enough. He's a, oh, nice. uh, a humorous writer. Uh, yeah. I know there are other questions. So Heather, thank you. I appreciate you yeah. being here. Um, mm -hmm. Helpful. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And we will bring Jenny in. Hi, Heather. Thank you so much for hosting this. It's your wealth of knowledge, and I'm very grateful as well. Um, I just wanted to echo, I, I saw that there's another question about this as well from um, Jana as well, but I was really curious. I have heard numerous um, you know, different types of feedback on resume length and mm -hmm. I think I'm struggling because I'm an elementary school teacher and I'm looking to transition into higher ed. So, so much of my experience is elementary school level. And again, I don't want to use the negative language, but yeah. to transition, um, number one, how far back do you, do we go? Do we go back to university and show the wealth of experience, you know, 13, 15 years post graduation, or is it most recently from your master's degree, I guess, what would you recommend? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you for this question. And thank you for, for being an elementary school teacher. That's <laughs> awesome. You're so important. So thank you so <laughs> I much. Appreciate you. Thank um, you. So, and I get this question a lot about resumes. So your resume in education, this is a beautiful thing. It can be as long as you want it to be, as long as it's relevant. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I say relevant and that I have seen, you don't necessarily need to put your, you know, Hey, I, I got a letter and track, you know, in high school. <laughs> so unless you want to be a coach, um, but so, you know, so be, you know, make sure it's relevant and know that the most important things need to be up towards the front of your resume. So obviously your current position, um, because at, at, attention spans, you know, so I have seen resume resumes that are 13 pages long accompanied by like a four page cover letter. Don't you don't they're not going to read that cover letter. So I think more importantly, your cover letter should be a page and a half um, and don't do a page and a half at like 18, you know, maybe font like, you know, a font that normal people can read. But, you know, a page and a half is all you need. But but your resume as long as it's relevant, you know, include it. So in it, I say, because it could be relevant to one position and not to something else. And you can absolutely go in and tweak your resume per position using, again, using their language, but don't feel like, oh, I, you know, this is it. Like, remember in the days where we had to print them and send them out? You probably don't. Um, I do, I do. <laughs> but okay. So, so yeah, you have to do that now. So you can change it up, um, you know, for whatever, you know, a position you were applying for. Um, but absolutely, you know, they're going to look at that first piece, that that first kind of chunk there. So your you know, your current your current job and what you're doing, and probably that next one and the other one they might, you know, if something piques their interest, they're going to read more on that. And ideally, we want them to read the whole thing, but and they will, but just know this first couple of pages are. But don't like I've had people try to cram stuff into two pages, and I was like, what did you you know what did you do for the other twenty years? Like don't do that. Like yeah. you know don't leave them with more questions. Um, and if it's something, uh, it, we like to say list your school and then, then, and this is for any, any position, nonprofit, an agency, independent school, whatever it might be, list your current position, wherever you are an agency and put a couple of lines about that, okay. you know, tell us about it because what you want to provide context for the reader, but what you don't want them to do is leave your resume and Google it and then not come back. So right. you want to have that information there for them. So. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I hope that was helpful. It was. Thank you very much. So I, I did put up in the uh, 
chat, we did a, I did an EDD resume tune up workshop in the in the fall. So if folks want to check that out, but some of the messages that I tend to give folks, and this is kind of from a university administrator perspective, and, and Heather, I'd like your perspective as well. You know, generally you've got eight to 15 seconds to capture somebody's attention as they're reviewing resumes. And it's certainly, they're going to re read it all if they find something compelling, if, if they can't find what they're looking for. Um, is that kind of your set? And you're right, it can be as long as possible, but that top part, that first two pages is the primary real estate. Yeah, yeah. And if they're, and we like to talk about there's two different types of people. There's a person who reads a cover letter and if they're interested enough, they go to your resume or they start with the resume and then they switch to cover letter. I'm a resume cover letter person. Um, I have to read all of them, so it doesn't really matter. But, but you know, so you 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 have to make both of them just as compelling because you don't know who's going to be reading that. But yeah, this first couple of pages, really what they're going to look at. Yep. And then with a cover letter, max out at two pages. Shouldn't be more longer than that. Yeah. And and so many of you have heard like your resume has got to be one page or two pages. That is young professionals, right? So like right out of your master's program you know, you're thinking one or two pages, but that will evolve fairly quickly. And at the end of the day, you want to capture all of that. So if you've got a high level position, you've got a lot of experience to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you may want to customize it if you've got a lot of different areas that you're focused in on. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it's that linkage. So great. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to um, give Bill a chance to ask his question. That's, uh, thank you. So uh, Heather, appreciate and echo everybody's sentiment, you know, fantastic insight. And Ryan, thank you for pulling this together for all of us. Um, my question is, is centered back towards uh, those that are making career transitions, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you have a diversity of types of work that you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. One of the things that through my, my experience in trying to transition in the higher education space is a lot of the job postings use specific language in terms of uh, basic or as necessary requirements or experience that bound it specifically in that domain already. So mm -hmm. difficult to get the foothold in. How do you recommend for folks who are trying to transition to be able to articulate equivalencies in a way that gets through that first bias is like, oh, this person doesn't have 10 years of student services. No, but I've led young people for many years and done all the same types of things. Let's have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Your cover letter? I mean, use that in your cover letter. Exactly. I've led, you know, 10 years of experience working with, you know, whatever, 18 to 22 year olds, whatever it might be um, in, a, in a, just a different capacity. Um, but put that in your resume too, because what happens, I think, is is someone in higher ed is looking at it with that lens and they don't understand it. So, and unfortunately, you have to help them understand it. Um, so explain that to them what that looks like. And and it might seem a bit elementary to you because you know it, but but think of, you know, and I like to say when your search committees could have all different types of people on it, including students, and some students aren't going to understand it either. So you got to make sure that you're you're writing it in a way, especially the cover letter, that it's going to resonate with everybody on the committee, something in there. So um, I'd be happy to work with you on that if you want to send me your resume, especially if you're applying for something, and I I can say, hey, these are the, this is the language, this is what I might look at um, for you. Be happy to help with that because I know that it does get frustrating because you have the experience, but you're not getting in front of them to talk to them to, to be able to demonstrate that if you get to work with a search firm i think that will help you um because that's exactly what we're there for to really kind of and i love pulling candidates in that might seem like they're a little bit out of the box that non-traditional and bringing them forward to the committee and making them think about those folks so i'd love to help you wonderful thank you i uh i'll connect with you on linkedin and ask for a follow-up yeah and ryan's got my email so you can also yeah and, and we'll post that up in, in just a minute. We've got a couple of questions. Uh, I want to jump to the chat. We had one posted earlier uh, from Tamara on, will positions always be listed on both the institutional's web board, institution's web board and Spelman Johnson's website, or should they be monitoring uh, the search firm websites for exclusive postings? Great question. Um, in a perfect world, I would say they'd be on both. Um, 
but I know for a fact they're not. Um, they're supposed to. They they when they contract with this, they say that they will um, advertise on their website, but sometimes they don't. So I would check with ours. I mean, ours for sure will be updated. Right. Um, and and I'll mention. I mean, it it depends too. Sometimes you have to apply through the university's website. Sometimes it uh, you just apply through the search firm. And so it's, again, looking at the postings to see. But generally, if you've got a few institutions that you are following, yeah, you've got to look at a few different spaces mm -hmm. for that information. I'm posting, Heather, your, your email so folks can get in touch with you if they have questions. Um, we're at 447. Well, we'll uh, we've got two questions on deck, so we'll have opportunity to, to ask those questions. And, and thank you again for everybody who's submitting questions and we're trying to make sure we're covering those. Angela, if we're missing, any questions in the chat, let me know. Uh, Ethan, we'll bring you in to ask your question. All right, great. I'm gonna say thank you as well, like everybody else has. Uh, question for you. So let's say we have a master's degree and eight or nine years of higher ed leadership experience already. Mm -hmm. We're in our doctoral program right now. My question to you would be, is there a ideal sort of timeline in there to start applying to these types of roles at bigger schools? Mm -hmm. Or, I guess, and or, could that be perceived as a hindrance because you're I'm actively in school, for example? I have never seen it be a hindrance that you're actively in school. Um, I think it might be a smidge hypocritical <laughs> when you're applying for yeah, jobs within higher ed to hold somebody, you know, to hold that against somebody. Um, I, I don't think there's a perfect time. I think that really depends on you and where you are. Um, in, you know, it's, it is, I will tell you from experience, and I'm sure some of you are doing this now, working full time and writing that dissertation or even finishing out classes is a lot. Um, it consumes your life. Um, so it, it's really kind of what works for you. Um, and, and where you are in your current position, are you still happy there? Are they treating you well? You know, those types of things. If not, then it's it's time to start looking. Then absolutely, then start looking. But um, I mean, if I, I don't think there's the, you know, I, I wouldn't say starting starting a new program and starting a new job at the same time, probably not the best thing to do. What do they talk about? The things that you shouldn't do. There's like, you know, starting a new job, moving and getting a divorce or something all at the same time, you know, you know. <laughs> so I would say starting a new program and starting a new job at the same time, not probably what you want to do. But if you feel or you're comfortable with that, you know, and I think that the eight or nine years of experience, is it the same institution? Yes. Yeah. So you, at that point, I always say you need to start looking at, you know, if you've been someplace for so long, it's like, do I want to stay here forever or is it time for me to, to start looking? So um, there's that piece of it. So, you know, sometimes you you get you've been at an institution for so long that it's hard for someone to see you someplace else. So they're always like, well, why is he leaving? You know, why they've been there 20 years. Why now? You know, but you're at a good spot that, it, you know, it makes sense to to start. Okay, I just kind of talk around that whole thing for you, but my, so <laughs> to wrap that up, yeah, it really depends on you. I don't think there's a, other than starting a new program and a new job, that's a bad thing, but I think it's really dependent on, you know, where you are and how comfortable you are with, you know, kind of, because you know, in a new position, it's, it's going to take some time as well. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you for your question. Um, and we will, uh, Akuna, let's have you join us. Hello, can you hear right? me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you so much for making this a Zoom and not a webinar. I feel like being in the PhD program, our classes are during the day. And so we don't get to see the master students or the EDD students. So sometimes this is our only chance to get a sense of who other, yes, hello, to get a sense of who other people are and what they're doing and what they're interested in. So thank you so much for making it a Zoom. My question is actually about uh, independent schools and head searches. There seems to be a trend where heads are serving for a shorter and shorter period of time, right? Like I feel like before it was, oh, someone would be a head for 10 years or you know, it seems like for until they retire and now there seems to be a lot more moving around. And so my question was around that, if you're still seeing that as a trend and if folks who are doing searches are looking for 
heads were going to serve for a longer period of time? Or is that something that they feel like, oh, this is just power of the course and we need to be prepared for a lot more turnover? Yeah, they're they're preparing for more turnover as things change. Um, absolutely. You know, would they love someone to stay for 10 years? Probably, you know, but that's probably not the reality of, of that happening anymore. And they're prepared for that. I think with the the um it was, that was an interesting uh, kind of space for me to learn about was the independent schools and had a great time um, work, working with some of them. And I actually have a colleague um, who works closely with them as well. So if you're interested, I could put you in contact with him so you could have some discussions because he's done more head of school searches um, than I have. But um, one of the things that is always interesting, and I think people are shocked by this, is, you know, if you live on which generally the head, you know, lives on campus and a lot of them, you know, they do a background check on everybody who lives with you. So yeah, you're in, so if your family moves on campus with you, everybody's getting that background check. <laughs> but it's, it's the, um, it's really the, the, the piece of working with the families and how parents are so involved. Um, the search process, you know, when you come to, it's like everyone has an opinion. So really kind of opening yourself up to just being aware of that you're going to have, you know, families and parents as well as the faculty um, and the students. And um, the faculty, the one thing I hear a lot of, from, from faculty is they want to make sure whoever comes in is going to have their back. Um, meaning when something happens, especially in a, a student goes and may not be the most accurate representation of what might have happened and then the parents call to really find out what happened before you know you can it's a, that's what I hear from them is we want someone who's really going to stand up for us who's going to talk to us find out what happened um, and really have her back when something something does occur um, and I've heard that a lot lots of different times actually at, at different types of schools independent schools boarding schools day schools all of that to making sure that that head of school that they, they uh, can always support their faculty but yeah, if you want to, yeah, email me and I will I will connect you with my colleague. Perfect. Will do. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we've got one more question in the chat. I think it's it's worth discussing, and then we're going to uh, wrap things up. And I've got a few announcements that I'll share. But uh, from Marisol, what is the latest recommendation for addressing career gaps in your resume and cover letter? Okay, if you're not working with a search consultant, um, it's you can put it on your resume. I mean, you can say, you know, I was doing this. I have seen that, and then nobody asks any questions. It's like, okay, or have it in your cover letter. Um, you know, and I don't know what your gaps look like. I mean, if there are a couple of months here or there, if it's, you know, three three years or a year or something, someone, you know, one of the easiest things to do is to go down a resume and check dates. Um, and so some, some folks will do that. So, um, you know, putting it, you can, you can put it right in there. This is what I was doing at the time or why I left this. I have seen people do that in their resumes that they have put, you know, left, left this position for, you know, got promoted or whatever it was. Um, but being honest and upfront about that is very helpful because like you said, you don't, I mean, I've seen search committee said the most wildest things. I'm like, where did yep. you get this from? Just because someone wasn't working for a year. Uh, you know, life happens. Lots of things happen. So. Well, and if it's if you're working with a search firm, I think to your earlier point, make sure you have that conversation mm -hmm. with the search firm and and then decide if you want to call it out. I, mm -hmm. I my sense is people have gotten a little bit more understanding post pandemic of yeah. gaps. But, you know, I've had a question. I had a gap 10 years ago when I was in a search and they asked, oh, you had this gap in service 10 years ago. And so it's still something that that people will bring up. So um, better to get ahead of it, have some reference to it is generally helpful. And I'll just say whatever, you know, you've got to have a narrative and that narrative generally should be positive. And if you need help working through that, if you're working on a search firm, great. Talk to them. Know mm -hmm. that that, you know, we're available here on campus, too. If you're if you're just trying to figure out how do I bring this um, mm -hmm. up? And as you do informational interviews, talk to people at that institution. I mean, there's sometimes history at an institution where that becomes a real important focus point. Mm -hmm. And the same for if you've, you know, had a short tenure. I was there for, you know, 11 yeah. months. I was there, you know, something like that. If we can explain that or you can explain it, that's helpful too. Um, and, yeah. and 
a couple of those you can get away with, but if it starts becoming a pattern, three, four, five, where you've only stayed for a couple of years, that's they're gonna, that's a red flag for for uh, search committees. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That uh, oftentimes, um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll ask. Well, there's the question of EDD versus PhD that came up in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you've got a, a take on it, and largely I think it just depends. Um, but yeah, it depends on the position you're applying for. Um, we don't do a ton. Well, we're starting to do more academic searches, more deans um, and provost searches, which I think that's more the, the PhD route. Um, but I have yet to do a search where someone was other than counseling, um, where they you know want you had to have a PhD and that was it. So we've been pretty yeah. open. And I think a bigger thing is the CV versus resume. And if you're high, if you're in an academic position or presidency, you need to have a curriculum vita, which is the full length, everything you've ever done with research and publications and presentations. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Um, thank you again, Heather. I, I want to give you a chance if you've got any parting words of advice uh, for our, our group here. I would really appreciate it. I know they yeah. would as well. Um, other than use my email, I'm happy to help you if you if you need help. But really, parting words, I, I go back to don't don't talk yourself out of applying for something because you never ever know. And it could be you don't get that job, but they fall in love with you, and another one opens up that's similar, and they invite you back for it. So you know, like I said, you can't get the job if you don't apply. Um, and and you know, go for it if you meet the minimum requirements. Absolutely, you know, try for that. Um, and but I just want to thank you because I I miss my work in in on a college campus in student affairs and I know it's hard work it's harder work now than when I was I you know all these regulations come out and I'm like oh my gosh my friends um, so thank you for all that you're doing across everything nonprofits you know independent schools privates publics everything you all are doing great work and I I appreciate everything you're doing so wonderful. Well, thank you, Heather, so much for joining us. I really do appreciate it. Um, I, I want to remind folks, you know, our alums are here. The Trojan Network is lifelong and worldwide. And, and so, you know, don't hesitate. These are kinds of conversations I would encourage you to be engaged in, uh, you know, reach out to people where folks are happy to give uh, suggestions and advice. Uh, my closing advice is don't forget about career prep. If you're anticipating being in a job search within the next year or so, you know, start that process now. We have a lot of resources, both at the USC Career Center as well as uh, Ross Sears Career Services. Take advantage of those, you know, meet with us, um, and we're happy to guide you through that process. Uh, develop a plan and, and, and do a little bit at a time based on what you're available to do. Um, I will mention we've got a couple of upcoming events. One of them is uh, networking with higher education. Pros. So those that are interested in higher education, this is for students. Uh, we have a number of alums that are coming. So I encourage you to, to check that out. Uh, in addition, next week, we'll have our final installment of the, uh, uh, the search firm series. And we'll have David, uh, Dr. David Verdugo from uh, Leadership Associates, and he represents the K-12 sector. So you can register for that. Uh, session as well. But I wanted to thank everybody for, for participating and being engaged. Um, I know folks have to roll off, so I want to be careful about the five o'clock. I see, Christina, you have your hand up. And if, Heather, you want to hang out for a bit, sure. we can take uh, another question. But I do want to make sure people get to their classes and other places that they need to go. So to get those uh, announcements in. Um, and so, again, thank you. And thank you to Angela. Uh, Rincon, who's uh, gr my grad intern at the Career Services in Rossier. She's been helping me uh, navigate things, and especially to you, uh, Dr. Heather Larrabee, for being a part of today's conversation. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I would do it again if you need me, so let me know. Wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> yep. We had one question. There's yeah, mine's a really simple question. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much, Heather and Ryan, for putting this together. I'm a K-12 administrator finishing up my EDD program, and I'm really looking into transitioning into higher ed. Mm -hmm. I missed, I know, last week's uh, presentation on higher ed. So I guess 
my question to you, Ryan, is what was the difference between this search firm and what was presented on Wednesday? And then if we have access to that recording. That will be posted. So the two spots right now where our videos are posted are at um, Rossier alumni as well as Rossier's page. Um, and that one will be up on the alumni, uh, Rossier alumni page, uh, if it's probably in the next week or so. Um, the, you know, the advice from there, and, and Heather, so you know, it was uh, ACCT, and we had Dr. Mont Monte uh, Perez, who was there. Community colleges have a very different process, and not very different, but it's a very kind of structured process. Um, I, so, you know, if you're looking to transition, you know, understanding the differences between community colleges versus higher ed searches. Uh, so I think, you know, we talked a lot about the structure of those committees, shared governance becomes a really important message. And while it exists in other parts of higher education, they talk about it in different ways. And they very much look, whenever you're in an executive search in a community college, you will have designated reps from the faculty, from the staff, from classifieds, that'll be part of that search process. And you need to really speak to those audiences, which is not different than in other searches, but it, it's certainly much, it's, it's structured to, to have those conversations. Um, I don't know, Heather, do you have some? Yeah, um, and I think it goes back to like you talk about the informational sessions and, and you know, having, having those conversations and understanding what it's, what it's like um you know do you want do you know where you want to go or where you're looking or what type of well, job I would love to be like an adjunct professor for like preparation programs for either administrators or teachers that's really where my dissertation was I never really thought about it and I'm sure maybe I could do something else um but I'm just really trying to understand the this world that I'm not familiar with mm -hmm. yeah you know go ahead I'm, if you if, for the adjunct roles, adjunct teaching jobs are very different. I mean, you're not going to see those go through a search firm. And while those positions are posted, many of them go through informal channels. And so community colleges are very structured. I, I would say with an exception being adjunct positions. And they, they do draw from those pools, but you'll be most successful getting to know people in those areas, you know, talking to the folks that do the hiring because it is faculty chairs or whatever, you know, department heads uh, that do that hiring. And you just need to put your resume there and have a conversation. I encourage, like, like I said, informational interviews, but even offer, like, let me come in and do a presentation in some of your classes. Um, Cause ultimately these things can open suddenly and they're looking for, you know, who's, who can I tap? And when I've done adjunct calls, you know, sometimes that call, comes a month before classes begin. And that's not an aggressive search. That's just, who do I know? Or who does my, who do my faculty know that might be able to do this? Yeah. And I would add, put it out to your network, what you're looking for and, you know, share it with them because, you know, that just casts your net a bit wider and someone else might hear of something. Um, but Ryan's right. Anytime even, yeah, it'll be, you know, if you get a month, that's wonderful. Sometimes it's a week before. <laughs> <laughs> And right. they're like, hey, we have this. Do you want it? So, um, but put it out to your network and let them know that what you're interested in and what you could teach. And I think that that will also help as well. But I think also my experience as a assistant principal leadership, I think that's what I'm taking away from this because I think some of the skills, right, I could apply to some other positions. So I really do appreciate your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I've added my um, email in there too. Just remember, feel free to reach out. Uh, we're here to to support you. And so if you've got questions in, in navigating your job search, feel free to reach out. And, and, and I am certainly happy to meet with folks. So thank you again. I appreciate everybody for taking the time out of their busy schedules and having this conversation. And again, thank you, Heather, for uh, for joining us today. This has been wonderful. Thank you. I enjoyed it on the eclipse day too. So on the eclipse day. Very good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you everybody. Fight on. Fight and on.